what a way to start the night. What a way to start the event. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, plenty of love on Facebook as well. Thank you for that, your kind comments so far. Um, so we're going to start with our first open mic section. Um, and the first poet I'm going to welcome to the virtual stage, I'm going to see if I can do it right this time, is Lee Campbell. Hello. Um, I'll, I'll turn on my physio in a second. Um, you'll see why in a moment. This, um, this set contains imagery um, of my own artwork from the last 25 years. Artwork, paintings, drawings, photographs, etc. Okay, and it's called Clever at Seeing Without Being Seen. Thank you. I I I I I I I I discover the same other whilst under the cover creeping seeping peeping covert operations my teenage fascinations awkward altercations with non queer populations. Those sensations that taught me, if ever they caught me, sighed cautiously err, deliberately blur, words that infer derogatory slur. Spending my teenage years engaged in acts of looking at something in ways I was told I shouldn't. I got very clever, very clever at seeing without being seen. Spending longer looking at George Michael than learning his song lyrics. Saturday afternoon football with my dad in the 90s. Dad watched the match. I watched the players. Dad remembers the midfielder's tackle. I remember the midfielder's tackle. Dad watched the match. I watched the players. Brighton, my first gay pub, Queen's Arms, George Street. My heart a flutter, legs like mush. The street was George, my previous crush. Here's where I learned. Bigger the fish, bigger the tackle. Early noughties, in my early twenties. The King's Arms, Soho. I discovered bears and cubs don't just live in the forest. That time in the 90s when the only way I could see men in their underwear was in vintage fashion magazines from the 70s. Creeping downstairs whilst parents asleep to watch crap amateur straight porn on television X just to see a man naked. A young Rupert Everett full frontal on late night BBC Two. Black and white TV undiluted the beauty of his manhood. The look I got from the cashier when I bought a copy of Playgirl. Smuggling copies of Gay Times into my room just to see guys like me. Gay kissing scenes on TV. Dad trying to hide his discomfort and sometimes not. Eating, seeking, peeping. Discover the same other whilst under the cover. And that's the end of the uh, the end of the set. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lee. Wow, thank you very much. Wow, what an imaginative way to do it. I've never seen anything like that before on Zoom. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so up next for the virtual stage, I shall see if I can do this. Ask to unmute. Uh, hold on, remove the pin there. I'm getting there slowly but surely. Here we go. And Rod Whitworth, let me see. Here we are. Yes. Rod Whitworth, take it away. Thank you. Um, I, I, 
follow that. Um, <laughs> I, I think of this as a sort of random thoughts of a random mind, verse for a random time. This one's called shopping, but only for essentials, mind. Until the day our family got its first toilet rolls, torn squares of newspaper on a nail provided ample yet fragmented reading matter on such days. After washing your hands for 20 minutes while singing the hallelujah chorus four or maybe five times, cleaned the sink with Dettel. Save for its use as eardrops, more effective if warmed, olive oil is mainly valuable in cooking or an adjunct to a wide variety of salads. Providing I can get these toilet rolls home in time, I may have no need to soil my breeks. Whenever I hear the word kipper, I think of the Isle of Man. Whenever I think of the Isle of Man, I remember my mum's tale about my dad following her to Douglas. When I remember my mum's tale, I wonder who the hell was Douglas. Whenever I'm reminded of Douglas, I think of kippers and maybe kedgery. Like toilet rolls and toilet rolls. Of all the things I need now, a film for my camera is the most urgent. It must be 35 millimetres, preferably black and white. 24 exposures will give me three photos a day and a bit left over for the journey, when journeys come around again. Supposing I had Donald Trump's wealth. Just think, all those backs, all that scratching. Um, poetry's, the poetry scene is going to be different, isn't it? Like everything is going to be different. And it is evolving now, but it's important that um, right out loud is strong, strong enough to be able to evolve with it. And that's why it's very important uh, to get uh, the funding that's required. And I hope everybody watching will donate what they can to help with poetry. This one. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go called, on. This one is called Late. Although the time has passed for the usual seasonal greetings, the usual, usual phrase still carries a meaning. Let's start the year whenever we can or are allowed and hope for better in whatever follows on the heels of what we know has just gone. The thinnest of snow is bright in the sun that polishes the bark of the cherry tree into a high parade ground sheen like Sheffield steel, as bright as the cheap chirrup cheep of sparrows in the hedge and is picked up in the whitening of the magnolia's buds. The years turning calls on us to stop and breathe. Naive hopes come into their own that may not be naive. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you, Rod. Thank you. That's great. Wonderful. So our third open mic performer in this section is a uh, Isabel Clark, take it away, Isabel. Right, hi everybody. I hope you're all doing well. <laughs> Oops, where are I gone? Can you see me? Sorry. <laughs> Can you see me oh, now? Let's have a look. Have you got the wrong person? That's spotlight. There we go. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I don't know why that. <laughs> sorry about that. I do apologise. That's all right. That's okay. I uh, hope Here everyone's. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'll launch straight into it. All right. The year that never was. In the year that never was, Cahal never went with Graham to Gran Canaria in June, to Cadiz in September, then on to Mexico. Abora Buenaventura by Lopezan Hotel missed out on the splendid sight of Cahal's sun kissed Irish body brushed white with sand from the Med, blue from the Pacific, red from the day he forgot his sunscreen. In the year that never was, Andrew and Julie never flew to Australia, climbed the Harbour Bridge, took selfies at the Opera House, or ambled along Darling Harbour, where the gold-painted street artist sweated in the midday sun, all to the soothing throb of a didgeridoo. In the year that never was, Amy and Emily never went to Las Vegas to celebrate a 30th and mum's 60th, enjoyed the thrills of the Sun City Strip 
or the rapture on Diane's face when Magic Mike pulled the big white rabbit from out of his hat. In the year that never was, I didn't spend four nights in Skipton. Crossing the Pennines with a car full of truculence, never arbitrated arguments over life-changing issues like who sits in the front seat, where we should eat, or how far a youth should be expected to walk. In the year that never was, my daughter Anna never toured with the Wigan Youth Orchestra. Violins, cellos, flutes, raising no roots around the sleepy plazas of northern Spain. Nor did Leeds Taekwondo Society ever come camp in Windermere, Maria never cementing those fledgling friendships or finding new love under an old moon by a lake that was scattered with stars. The Otley beer run never ran, nor did the end of year ball where she wore the red dress and danced until the dawn and feet were blistered. In the year that never was, the things you'd planned and paid for never happened. Instead, the stress of calculating what you paid for and planned to get back, knowing you'd never get back some things, like your Ryan Airways flight, or the time that never was. And I know that some might think I'm selfish because Richard Branson lost millions. Dominic Cummings lost his credibility and others lost their dream holiday to the Seychelles. But I write from the painful rub of my own experience. And you can never put too high a price on four nights in Skipton. Thank you. That's it. Beautiful, love that. Thank you. And apologies for uh, accidentally spotlighting the, the, wrong, the wrong person. Sorry. That's okay. It doesn't uh, matter. It was probably a better version. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next uh, feature performer is Rachel Long, a wonderful poet who I first met through the Poetry Takeaway four years ago, whose debut collection, My Darling from the Lions, was shortlisted for the Forward Prize this year. So I shall attempt to spotlight Rachel. Ah, I've done it right. Hi, Rachel, you all right? Hey, Matt, how are you? Oh, I'm very good, thanks, how are you? I'm good, can you You can see and hear me? Yeah, I've spotlighted you. Can Amazing, you, then you're doing good? everything right. I'm getting there. It looks there. and sounds great. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you for um, inviting me to, to read um, this evening and to contribute um, to the good cause, to the greater good. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to read. Um, sometimes I do. So I'm kind of, and I, and I usually start reading my collection that kind of in the order that it is. Um, so I'm gonna do totally the opposite and see what happens. This is called Thanksgiving. As if by accident, I find my head washed up, window side of his bed, after all that fucking look, the sky still pinned up. His nose is longer with his eyes shut. This whole time I've been holding, squeezing, ringing, folding, bending, nodding, thank you, God for giving me someone who makes me hold my breath. I will be so light upon his life, he won't realize he's kept me. I'll leave not a mark on his pillow, papers, knife, DVDs or wine glass. What blessing. Only when he's sleeping can I breathe out. So deep my ribs come up like a ship. self-portrait with baby. You don't even have a baby. Haven't wanted one for a decade. You did, not to hold, but hold over them, the boys you loved and wanted to keep. You wanted a good glue, 
the most lasting, to render them unable to forget or delete you. Ill those now men striding up, slamming doors, parking on your private path as they will next Friday and the one after, one after another to your cottage door, knocking on the stained glass because they're still barbaric. You shudder, you must answer, pull your cardigan together, open your smart black door. Don't let them in, don't let them all the way in, but they're close enough already up the step on the welcome mat, train a toe cap or arrowhead of a smart shoe over the skirting on touching your scrubbed up tiles. You pick the baby up from where she's been this whole time on the bench under the window. How could you have missed her? Curled cute as a prawn in her pink brushed cotton. Blurry face, real hands, a hat, as if she comes with a carrier, a seat for a car you don't have and can't drive. The baby is yours, you know it like hunger. Hi, he says to his watch, ostentatious as ever, then reaches out, I'll bring her back Monday, you're weak, but lift the carrier and hand her, your baby girl, over to him or to him or the other. They knock one after the other to collect and collect your babies, which they say are also theirs, your babies together. It's only fair. There were agreements you can't break. You mustn't break. So you hand them over and over the threshold and she goes each time she goes. Car sweetness. Some long journeys back, mum would lay her hand over dad's on the gear stick, their wedding rings glinting, like mouths not used to smiling. Red Hoover. He was ridiculously good looking. He was even Nigerian, though mum flits between this being a good thing in people and the worst. I pulled his photo up on the internet, showed her. She decided on the spot his Nigerianness was a good thing. It was easy to pull his photo up on the internet because he was an actor. I'd met him in a theatre. He'd just been awarded a £3,000 check for being a Nigerian actor. It was a very hot summer. I wore a black play suit belonging to my younger sister, but carried a blazer for a look that said, serious play. He offered to buy me a drink. Of course, I said I'd prefer to buy my own. And when he insisted, I said, okay like it was quite inconvenient for me to agree. When our drinks were on the bar and glistening in the velvet heat, he handed the barman his check. Ha ha ha, said the barman. Ha ha ha, I said. So, the ridiculously good looking Nigerian had jokes. On my lunch break, I found a clean bench to call him from. We were awkward, I wanted him to ask me out. Why wasn't he answering me out? Mum began answering after him. Where's that good looking Nigerian? Don't tell me, you've ruined it already. The second time I spread out on my bed, swung my legs up the wall, cold and good for my nerves. It was a short call because someone was knocking at his door. Okay, I said, like it was of no inconvenience whatsoever. I slid my legs back down the wall. A week later, I was standing in his living room, wearing my coat or it was over my arm, my shoes still on. 
either we were just about to go out or I just arrived and he hadn't yet said, here, let me take your coat or please take off your shoes. He was running all over the house, upstairs, then down, zooming around. He was running a bath, then letting the water out, only to fill it back up. He ducked into a cupboard and yanked a hoover, a red hoover. He began hoovering everywhere. He even hoovered the ceiling. He just walked up the wall and as he did, looked over his shoulder at me on the floor and said, this won't take long. I just have to. When I told mom, she shook her head, laughed, half lemon, half sugar. He's crazy, she shrugged. God's showing you it won't work out because he's all over the place. Shame, that good looking man. Nigerian, she sighed, always into something. I'd still look him up on the internet sometimes just to keep up to date with his plays, the BBC dramas. Then I stopped. For years, I didn't think of him. Okay, perhaps, but in a loose and smirking way, playful, no serious pining. What was there to pine, really? Then in bed, one night, watching an adaptation on my laptop, the ridiculously good-looking Nigerian walks across my screen. His name escapes my mouth, half sigh, half whistle. I say it like, damn, I say it like, man, where have you been? He has a few lines, then he's stabbed on a street. I recognize having danced down a long time ago, long before I met him at that theater with his check folded into his pocket. I remember our two awkward phone calls and him hoovering his ceiling. And I laugh into my pillow as he bleeds out. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I'm a little bit short of time. Sorry, Matt, but I won't dare to read another one in case I'm not. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so, so much. That was fantastic. You are very, very welcome. Um, it's, a, yeah. it's a real honour to have you on tonight. It really is. It's wonderful. Um, and yeah, congratulations on everything with uh, my darling from the Lions. It's just been wonderful to see. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we move on to our second open mic section. And the first performer in this section is Peter Taylor. So I shall see if I can spotlight. There we go. Yes. Um, and then I need to unmute. Uh, here we are. Peter Taylor, take it away. Hello. I have a one poem for this evening. It's called Waking Up to Snow, which is vaguely topical given the, the fall we had a few days ago. But it's also topical in the sense that it does touch on distancing. The thing is that the poem was written six years ago, but um, there you are. Waking up to snow. Woke up to snow today and was glad I had to be up and out, to be about before the silence broke. I like the idea of white all round, emerging as the night draws back, revealing random perambulations, say, the fox that senses scents are dulled beneath the snowy overlay. My turn to tread and feel the ease of printing paths across the land, more clearly than a walk on sand, earth, grass or stone. Now I could send a snow code note to all those who might be watching from above. Who might they be? I guess that with snow signs you must believe and so say something, others just see. First light, snow alone, a brand new canvas for the ice smith, starting fresh. Man's home for a moment washed, pure and cleansed. Lay those words end to end and you'll get some idea of the simple goodness in any layer of nature's white. Come my night, turn me inside out and cover me bathed in bright moonlight. A score more cures, I'm bound to say, array themselves in my tidy mind, alongside new opportunities. 
though subdued in winter's grey. A shaft of light required to set on fire the snowflake chandelier. To give a clearer view of works of art that wait patiently, yet are anxious to be free from the shadows in our hearts. My choice today of such treasures, joy unmeasured, all those photographs of have long meant to my fasting soul to feast on, of five bright young lights, now grown and flown, in the sense that hugs all round give way to softer caresses of thankful thoughts, a touch of sorts. And we're more than grateful for it, and for the snow's good work, of course. Thank you. Lovely. That was fantastic. Thank you, Peter. It's mad, isn't it, how you write it six years ago and that it, it's like regains this new meaning in the current climate. It's, it's wonderful how poetry works like that. <laughs> Thank you. OK, Pleasure. so our next performer is uh, Rachel Burns. I shall see. Here we go. Hi, Rachel. You all right? Hey, yes. Take my glasses wonderful. off to read. Thank you, Matt, sure. for um, the opportunity and... It's been lovely to hear everyone read and it's been fantastic. I'm going to read from um, A Girl in a Blue Dress, which is my um, debut poetry collection. Demolished. I see cranes and bulldozers hard at work. The old benefit offices demolished into a pile of rubble and scattered bricks. A fire truck douses the wreck. Thick clouds of smoke rise up like ghosts of welfare past. I remember going cap in hand to the DSS for a crisis loan in the days you were given a number and sat in rows chatting and smoking with other desperate comrades. There was no money, the rent was due, you'd not eaten for days, the bairn is out of nappies. You were scraping the bottom of the SMA baby milk tin, literally. You hold the baby up to the security glass like an offering so the benefit officer can see. She looks at you both like dirt and tuts, but tut, tut. Gives you a number and you're back in line, smoking like a chimney to calm your nerves. Every now and then someone kicks off and is thrown out by security. They keep you waiting until the final hour when your number is called, your heart almost stops. He snatched the gyro check and raced to the post office before closing time. Buy bread, nappies, baby milk and 10 cigarettes. I don't smoke anymore. I stare at the smashed up wreck of the old benefit officers, at the pile of rubble, the scattered bricks. I weep, though can hardly believe it, for the loss of the safety net for the clippy mat ripped right out from under our feet. And I'll read one more. Catholic girl guzzle. Gotta love us Catholic girls, worshipping Madonna, singing Madonna, mimicking her dress, the sharp crop, sexy tops, just like Madonna. We are good Catholic girls, dare to bear our naval girls, Chewing Wrigley's gum, hoops in our ears, crucifixes swinging from our necks, sexy like Madonna. Look, now we're meeting up with bad boys, don't go to mass boys, sexy boys with fast cars who tell us we look pretty, just like Madonna. At Sunday mass, we break bread and sing, hallelujah, hallelujah, until we burst. The Virgin Mary holds out her hand to us. Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother Madonna. The Immaculate Conception, she holds out her hand. She sees our bangled arms dripping with sin. She knows where we have been, does Madonna. One by one, we all succumb to temptation. Yet another teenage pregnancy. And the Catholic Church spits us out, slams the altar door. Even Madonna's smile turns into a scowl. We have brought shame on our families. We are thrown out like dogs into the street. Broken, 
Balin, Madonna. And my friends say, Rachel, give it up. You're too young. I listen to Madonna sing her silly pop song, Papa Don't Preach, and I laugh, but I keep my baby. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. That was lovely. And that's from your, that was from your debut collection. Is that right? Yes, yeah. it is. It's from A Girl in a Blue Dress, and it's um, by Vain Women Press as the publisher. Cool. Lovely. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so our final open mic performer is um, Heather Molson, which I'm guessing Heather is on John's iPhone. Yes, yes. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Sorry about that mix up before. I do apologise, Heather. Sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. It was nice being spotlighted. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, super. Thank you for having me on here. This is a this is a great cause and a great idea. Um, I've got the one, and it's um, colours of seventy three. Lizzie's wobbly thighs are purple with cold, limited heating, looming blackouts. Yet everyone's seeing red. My true blue mum calls Heath a traitor. What a dim view to take. And speaking of which, Liz says she's asked Paul Watkins round. I go pink. He says there's a new Slade Christmas song. We put on top of the pops, the black and white screen clearly shows us the colour of Noddy Holder's trousers. Paul, despite his worldliness, confesses he'd never been to a party before. He got off with Susan Turner. He didn't know whether to ask her out, despite kissing her for hours to Python Lee Jackson. She still doesn't set him on fire. What's the point of all that smooching and snogging if he's not going to come to anything? And I wonder what colour Susan's love bites are today. I know my face is turning green. We give Slade a lukewarm reception. That record will never catch on. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Oh, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> So, but believe it or not, we're nearly halfway through this event. It's absolutely flying by. Um, and just to remind everybody, obviously, we're, we're raising funds for Write Out Loud. So Write Out Loud have existed for 18 years um, as a poetry organisation, uh, championing, encouraging, inspiring, connecting poets from prize winners to open mic performers, uh, putting on events, uh, the gig guide, the blog, the reviews. They just do incredible work. Anybody who's a poet. Uh, on the UK scene knows right out loud and, and internationally as well to be fair but you can't really be an active poet and not know right out loud so it's so important to the community so I was really honoured when uh, when Julian contacted me and asked me to come on board in the summer to help out um, and I really hope that the, the fundraising campaign can go some way to building right out loud even bigger for 2021 and beyond like we've said before people have been donating during the event which is fantastic it's very very much appreciated um, as I've said Every event, uh, sorry, every donation between now and midnight on Sunday is doubled up to a grand total of 10k. But I don't need to worry about that disclaimer. But every donation is doubled, so one pound becomes two, which is fantastic. So now I'm going to share um, a video which was sent in by a performance poet and comedian called Robert Garnham. I'm just going to open the window. Uh, da -da 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 -da, bear with me a sec. I'm getting my, getting my Zoom swag on, see if I can handle something this technically advanced. Yes, I can. Hold on. Right. So I need to share my screen. Advanced sharing options. Only one. Yeah, no, not advanced. Oh, God. Sorry. It won't be a sec. Share my screen. Share sound. That's it. Jobs are good. In. Oh, yeah. That cures the shakes. Oh, hello there. Robert Garnham oh, here. Why is the sound not working? Sir of oh, Whimsy, yeah. poet without portfolio, devotee of biscuits. Um, 
just thought I'd do a few poems for you. So what I'm going to do, I've got a little timer here. I'm going to set it for four minutes. I'm just going to try and do as many poems as possible in the next four minutes. I'm going to start with this one. It hasn't got a title yet, actually. It's just called Poem. Hot, hot surfer dude dancing on the wave. Hot, hot surfer dude, you live a life I crave. Hot, hot surfer dude, you are so very brave. Hot, hot surfer dude, watch out for that walrus. Hot, hot surfer dude, I'd invite you back to my beachfront surf shack, but you probably drip all over the floor. Thank you. This one's called Poem. Glass flan dishes from Cuba. Baking dishes from Antigua. Quiche dishes from the Yucatan Peninsula. Measuring jugs from the West Indies. Microwave-proof glass pans from Trinidad. Yes, it's the Pyrex of the Caribbean. Thank you very much. This is called Poem. If there's a bell, ring it. If there's a song, sing it. If there's no plan, wing it. If there's a boomerang, fling it. If it comes back, fling it. If it comes back, fling it. If there's a packed lunch, bring it. If there's a new book, begin it. If it's rubbish, bin it. This poem's quite good. In it. Thank you very much. And this one's called Poem. Flick the switch, the bulb goes ping. A sudden glare from deep within. An atmosphere dulled can take your stamp. Whether standard or table, you're an excellent lamp. That was just a bit of light verse. I wish I had a cow, I would pat it on the head. It would sleep at night in a barn wrapped up in its bed. I wish I had a cow, I'd take photos so I had proof. I'd write for it bad poetry, improvised on the hoof. I wish I had a cow, I'd tell everyone about it. I'd go on and on and on and on, on and on and on and on, on and on and on and on, on and on and on and on. But I wouldn't want to go on for too long. I wouldn't want to milk it. Thank you very much. Your eyes look like they're made of slugs. Yes, they are. Your ears are like two piles of sick. Yes, they are. Your breath's as rank as a devil's fart. Your face looks like a big slapped ass. Why the hell did I fancy you? And that was called Toby. There once was a man from Wigan who walked around with a big wig on. The chap had no hair, but the hair he had there was so voluminous that people said, that's a big un. And this one is called Poem. My friend Bob is shaped like a wheel. He's ever so circular and he runs downhill. He's got 360 degrees, which is several more than me. The doctors had a conference to talk about his circumference. One day a car pulled up and the driver said, Is Bob here? Is Bob round here? Mucked up the end there. And I said, Bob's round everywhere. Well, thank you very much. My name has been Robert Garnham, and I'm doing this for the good people of Write Out Loud, who are having a fundraiser at the moment. If you like the work that Write Out Loud are doing, then why don't you bung over a few quid? And whatever you donate can be doubled with the Match It scheme. Um, so yes, I hope you have a really good evening. My name has been Robert Garnham. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Oh, hold on. Great stuff from Robert. Absolutely wonderful. I'm so glad that he said that in. He's such a wonderful uh, performer, such a wonderful poet and a wonderful human as well. 
Um, so yeah, it's been great to, that Robert sent in that video and we've had other people as well. So like uh, Neil Astley from Blood Axe Books uh, paid a wonderful tribute. Kate Fox paid a wonderful tribute. Um, Elvis McGonagall sent one in this afternoon. Like we've had so many poets come to us with videos and messages of support, which is which is a real honour and it's testament to everything that Write Out Loud has achieved over the years and uh, the role that it's played in so many poets' careers. Um, I was just chatting to Rod earlier about how many poets it must have inspired or given a leg up or you know, nights that will have started and friendships that will have been born and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, it's fantastic. And, uh, yeah, I I'm really proud to be involved in Write Out Loud. Um, and that's why we're doing this event tonight. So next uh, we have a feature slot from Antonia Jade King, who is one of my favourite poets. Uh, she is a co-host of Boomerang and published her debut pamphlet, She Too Is a Sailor, with Bad Betty Press on the 24th of June, 2019. I know of a specific date for some reason. So I'm just going to... How are you doing, AJ? You all right? I'm good. Your knowledge is impressive. I think I've just spotlighted... Yeah, I've spotlighted you I, correctly this time. You are, you are, yeah. It's all good. Yeah, no, I just... I was looking at it earlier and I just... I just... I don't know why I've memorised the date. It's, it's, but yeah, She Too Is A Sailor. It's a wonderful pamphlet out on Bad Betty. Um, I'm dead chuffed you could join us tonight. How are you doing? You all right? Uh... Is that just me or is AJ frozen a little bit? Ooh. Not sure what's happening. Let's try again. Oh no. Is that ah, it's not just me. Uh, it looks like Antonia might have uh frozen. Hmm. Not sure. Let's see if we can start it again. Hold on. Oh, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, I shall give. Uh, I shall give Antonia a minute. Um, to see if she can maybe hopefully rejoin. Uh, see if her internet connection can be sorted out. I'm going to give you a very short poem about uh, some of my favourite things, which is teaching Scotland and food. There was once a teacher from Fife who tried to eat soup with a knife. He coughed and wheezed and spluttered and sneezed and the soup went all over his wife. There you go. Everybody's praying that <laughs> AJ, AJ's camera works now. Hello, you all right? Is this working? I didn't know if it was working for everyone or for just me. Hello. It, yeah. Sorry about that. It's all good. It's all good. Take it away. Um, Antonio Jade King. In my mum's mouth, it means I named you, so men do not need to. In his mouth, my name sounds like my mum's mistakes. Sounds like I will name you with my fist. Sounds like I will name you ant. Ant like small brown thing. Ant like something you don't want. Occasionally, I still hear him filling my name with ants. Mum didn't name me before I was born. She felt unable to know me before she had heard me cry. He felt the same. She gave me her surname, not a man's. Thought that if they followed my name, maybe they would follow me too. But my name is not protection for men or men's hands. It can't be. It's just a name. But I want a new name. One that only my mother knows because this one now sounds like Ant. And like small brown thing, and like, do you know how much she can hold on her back? I will give this new name only to my mother. It will not fall into the mouths of men who still think me in need of naming. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Camera still working? Um, this one is called Handshaking Isn't Always a Sign of Nerves. Um, I'm not sure if Rachel Long is still here, but I wrote this in a Barbican Young Poet um, Barbican Young Poet session that Rachel was leading, along with Jacob Sam Rose. Um, so yeah, this one is called "Handshaking Isn't Always a Sign of Nerves." They told me that sometimes it can be deliberate, something you could stop if you so desire. But do you ever count your steps as you walk? Do you think if you read enough, you can actually disappear into a character? When I was younger, I wanted to be one of the sisters from Little Women, 
or another girl who seemed too preoccupied by plot to have a busy brain? Have you ever convinced yourself that if you don't count a step, then your mum will die? When I tell you that I do this, you tell me that you're so OCD too, followed by a comment about how you alphabetize your bookshelf. So I stop the conversation to tell you about how I find holding an amethyst stone calming in another world, I walk normally. There are no numbers in my head or amethyst in my hands and I read books for other reasons than to disappear, like enjoyment. I notice fun things, like the small smile my mum has when she sits in a really comfy coffee shop chair, how she blows to call her espresso, even though it's already drinkable, but I am counting my steps instead. Did you know amethyst hurts your hand after a while when you tight? And what do you think will happen if you don't alphabetize your bookshelf? Thank you. Um, this one is called, um, thank you. I could just see like lots of people doing that. So thank you. Um, this next one is called diary snippets. Um, I've been keeping a diary for like maybe six months now. And I find going through it really funny because I often write my diary at like midnight to 1 a.m and my head goes to wild places so um i've tried to find like find some poems in there so this is um a poem called diary snippets from november 2020 written from my diary in november 2020 original title um i'm really good at watching television and films now me and liv have started saying what characters we are most like in whatever we are watching Yesterday, we watched Shrek. I'm donkey. Due to the fact that I talk too much and lack self-awareness sometimes. I haven't been productive today, but I've smiled five times and I'm donkey now, so I guess that's something. Today, I moved between the living room and the bedroom, which was very exciting, but the tree outside my window looks sad, but I'm calm and my calmness makes me nervous. And can I cover my mum in hand sanitizer and bubble wrap? Because 2020 keeps flinging shit and I'm not sure how well we can dodge it and for how long so she can walk around covered in layers of hand sanitizer and bubble wrap like a COVID compliant marshmallow woman. Today, I thought I heard an alarm, but I didn't. Must have been a phone outside my window or something. Now I'm worried I'll waste all my time worrying when the worst hasn't even happened yet then what will my brain do when the worst does happen? I wish my thoughts slowed down when the world did, but my head is all hand sanitizer and nerves and sometimes movies. When this is done, will I still be able to make small talk with strangers? I used to be so good at that. Will strangers' mouths and noses always terrify me? Will I still talk too much because I feel very self-aware now? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm a massive Fresh Prince fan, um, like huge, and um, this, this next poem is based off um, an episode where Will Smith is locked in a basement with his girlfriend of the time, one of many, um, because there's an earthquake, and she does stuff that anyone would do to make themselves comfortable when they're going through an earthquake in a basement, like take her heels and wig off, but apparently this like isn't acceptable to Will, um, so yeah, this is called Ten. I'm 10, watching Will Smith locked in a basement with his girlfriend. She takes her wig off, there's an earthquake. He calls this wig deception, we laugh. He sings that his girl is getting on his nerves. She throws her fake nails in his face, we laugh. He sings, I thought she was fine. Calls her a liar, we laugh. He sings that he doesn't know if even her body is hers. I'm 10, questioning what men will allow me to do to my own face when I'm older. Thank you. It's so, it's so lovely just to like look up at my screen and see this. <laughs> um, <laughs> this next one, again, I won't in BYP. I, I write about my mum quite a lot. Um, and this one, I was just thinking about the differences between us and how we navigate the world. And um, this one is called Mum Can Get Her Hair Cut in Half an Hour. Mum can get her hair cut in half an hour, and I believe this to be a superpower. 
maybe this is all power is extra time and rapid bleach. In another world, I get my hair cut with her. With our extra time, we brunch, then we walk. We breeze past people who notice that we smell like sea salt shampoo and we smile. We are all messy bun, light and free. No one walks into us. Thank you. Um, this, this next one is about another icon, Maya Angelou, and I admire her for many reasons, of course. Um, but one of them is when I was reading her autobiographies for the first time, I was struck by um, how much she valued her own time and her rest time, um, and how she could literally be a part of revolutions. And then the next day she'd be like, I'm gonna go buy some new bed sheets because I need them. And I thought there's something really beautiful and actually radical about that. So I wrote this. Maya and her protest are going furniture shopping. They have taught themselves how to sleep. They are collecting nice furniture and soft bed sheets just because her body likes them. They are giving soft melodies to audiences who ask her for volume and power Maya and her protests left a man because he didn't make them sing. They do not worry about perfect grammar. When your words hold a revolution, why worry about commas? Maya and her protests do not smile for photographs unless they are happy. And they are in a head wrap and hoop earrings, looking side on into a camera as if to say, I know you won't capture me perfectly, so I am going to sleep now. I think I've got time for one more, according to my timer. Hey, cool. Um, this one is called Ira Aldridge reads a review of his latest performance. And um, for those who don't know, Ira Aldridge was the um, the first black guy to play a fellow and a, another icon of mine, I guess. Um, so yeah. Ira Aldridge reads a review of his latest performance to see that the critic has called it surprising. Mm -hmm. They were particularly shocked by the way Aldridge navigated the most difficult passages of script. Ira thinks this is ironic. He always finds the difficult passages the easiest to perform well. Muscle memory, maybe. Another critic for Aldridge would struggle with the English words due to the shape of his lips. This is some time before he plays King Lear carefully painted white everywhere but his hands, Ira will be loved eventually. A state funeral level of adoration, they will even like his voice once they know that he will not ad-lib, that he can handle the difficult passages of English text in an acceptable fashion. Thank you so much. Uh, um, write out loud do amazing work. So donate if you can <laughs> <laughs> thank you antonia that was thank just you. uh magnificent that was so oh. so good i always love hearing what you share that was great and yeah she too is a sailor on bad betty press antonia's debut pamphlet get it it's wonderful oh. um so uh we are flying through the night this is really really exciting and i hate to put him on the spot but i wondered if julian might be up for a quick two minute chat he just nearly spat out his orange juice. If you're not up for it, it's totally cool. Just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It's entirely up to you. Yeah, he's up for a quick two minute chat. I think it would be lovely. Uh, so, da -da -da. hi Julian, how you doing, mate? You're right. Yeah, uh, sort of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're responsible for this. Well, that was fantastic. That was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah. she's great, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, marvelous. You've done really well, Matt. You are well. Uh, there's a, a full team of people who work at Write Out Loud. Obviously, you know, there's there's loads of people who work behind the scenes on various things. But I think a lot of people know you, Julian, and you've been there very much from the start. So uh, I just wondered if you had anything you wanted to add or say, or any memories or anything. The first thing I'll say is there aren't as many people as people think. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I often think we've got this big office somewhere, and we're funded by the Arts Council. And it just ain't true. We've just done it on um, on a shoestring all these years. But, you know, it's uh, it's amazing. But it's it's just about. I mean, I, I'll tell you the little story, which is that my I was in Bolton in a flat. My pal phones me up and he says, Julian, there's a there's a bloke doing a poetry night down the Man and Scythe. Bring your poems. I said, I don't write poetry, Dave. He said, Of course you do. Everybody writes poetry. Hmm. So I took my poems. 
And that's the first time I admitted that I'd been writing in secret. And as Write Out Loud went on, we found out that thousands of people write in secret. But what they, what they don't, it's a, it's a bit like a glass ceiling. It's only, put is only for those people up there. Yeah. And then if you give them a venue and a round of applause, this, that's all it's been about, really. The website was just about giving giving a, an, another means of sharing the information about how to do it and where you can do it, you know. And it's just grown. Um, but it's not it's not about me. It's about it's about people like people like Isabel who helped us over the years, but Paul who's who sits sits in a darkened room somewhere, writing all the software for the website. It, you know, it's it's about Greg and his news pages. It's about Graham, who, who never gets, he, he, he looks after the community, the online community, and all those people run the nights, you know, it's, um, it's just, it's just been fantastic. It's uh, fabulous. Yeah, it is a fabulous thing. And like I say, I'm honoured I'm, I'm honored to be part of it, a part of a journey now and look forward to seeing what we achieve uh, later this year and next year and going on. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Julie. And I think that means that means a lot to me. You say that, and I think it's lovely. To, it would be wrong to not have you say a few words at this event. I think the last thing is, it's not orange juice. Oh, <laughs> fair. <laughs> my, <I'll>, my bad. <laughs> um, right. So now we are going to have another video. This was sent in by a poet who you might have heard of called Tony Walsh, who earlier shared um, a programme which was from an event in 2004 in Bolton, um, which Tony performed at. And Olivia Coleman, Academy Award winner, Olivia Coleman was in the front row. Um, and yeah, it's just, it, obviously, as we all know, Tony is... Um, an incredibly successful poet with a, a global reputation and he's been on an immense journey himself recently uh, so we're really really happy that um tony shared this video so i am going to put it on da, 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 da. and here is tony walsh testing testing one two one two are you receiving good evening right out loud are you well i hope you're uh, all okay out there in these uh very unusual and a little bit uh, scary times. My name's Tony Walsh, they call me Longfellow, and I'm really absolutely delighted uh, to be with you all this evening. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for, you for inviting me along, Rice Out Loud. And tonight means a lot to me. I go way back with uh, Rice Out Loud to 2003, 2004, when I first shuffled onto the Manchester, the Northwest scene with my uh, hastily scribbled poems. Uh, I was 39 when I first read a poem in public and some of my first nights were with Write Out Loud. And this is maybe my second ever uh, headline gig for uh, for Write Out Loud at uh, Bolton Ochkin Theatre on September the 21st, 2004. It was a great night. People came from uh, yards around. And if you've got one of these, it's, uh, it's a real collector's item. These fetch hundreds and hundreds of pence on uh, eBay these days. Uh, but yeah, it's great to be uh, back with, um, great to have the band back together, as they say. So I'm going to read uh, a few paragraphs from my book, uh, the what I call the manifesto, the foreword of my book, in which I talk about how welcoming and inspiring I found what remains a, a hugely diverse and important um, performance poetry scene, slam poetry scene, open mic scene in this country. So this is my tribute to those days. Um, I'm talking here about how I came at this more from music and lyrics than, than from poetry, and it goes like this. So when in 2002, 2003, I wrote my first poem since my teens, now with a few of life's bruises, two small children and a terminally ill mother, this was my frame of reference, not avant-garde or avant-meaning, avant-engagement, avant-got-a-clue-what-you're-on-about-mate stuff, but poetry that might hopefully get a hearing in the streets and pubs of my hometown, poetry that would perhaps command the attention of music, comedy or theatre audiences, and poetry that could maybe, just maybe, change the mind of people expecting to be bored rigid. Often tightly rhymed and musically metered, we live our lives to rhythms and patterns, we're hardwired to receive them, but always trying to find a pulse or a heartbeat of some sort, poems for the milkman to whistle, to make him laugh and cry when he caught the words. 
So when I first wandered nervously into Manchester to stutter my stuff in packed, tiny rooms above old school boozers, I was thrilled to find that there were people who got my reference points and shared my frustrations, plus great local poets rising out of the local open mic scene onto national and international stages who would further inform and inspire my hopes of what poetry could be, should be, what it once was, what it could be again. Giving truth to the cliché. I found male and female, young and old, gay and straight, black and white, the skint and the solvent, poets of all shapes and surprises, sharing their stories, telling their truths and mercifully, miraculously minded to muse, muse momentarily on me mumbling mine. From under hoods and hijabs, I heard them. From under fringes and froze, buzz cuts and bobs, from under green hair and grey, mop tops and mohawks, dreadlocks and dreadful haircuts of all styles and none, I heard them. Shouting quietly whispering loudly, killing me softly with the poems. I found orators, creators and innovators whose dazzling diction and eclectic electric rhetoric simply demanded my attention. A folk poetry, all of it, storytelling, connecting us, mattering. Not here the classical curricular canon of Shakespeare and Cole, not here the free-form word jazz of the pre, post, avant, neo-quasi-experimentalists, not here even the so-called mainstream poetry, which sadly is only mainstream if you mainly stream it from the private lakes and remote backwaters of our culture, causing barely a ripple outside of its own talent pool. Not drowning, but not waving either. No, not here. Here was something else. To my life-changing delight, I'd stumbled across a poetry as ancient as it is modern. A poetry that, whether knowingly or not, is rooted in the age-old traditions and folk memories, memories that predate the written word. A vibrant, exciting poetry that borrows knowingly from hip-hop, reggae, punk and folk, that draws skillfully from theatre and stand-up comedy as well from traditional poetic forms and techniques, that learns equally from the sacred and the profane, from the saucy postcard and the gospel hymn, from the fire and brimstone preacher, preacher from pop culture and from the cultures of many lands. I found a poetry of Patois, Punjabi and Polari, of jingles, jazz and jive, of minstrels, monologues and music halls. I'd found tub-thumping, tongue-twisting, truth-telling troubadours, bombastic beatboxing, broadside balladeers, slamtastic street corners, soapbox slang-slingers. I found an accessible, democratic, people's theatre, no less. Unashamed to wear the masks of both comedy and tragedy, eschewing those of bafflement, boredom and blatantly bogus bourgeois belonging, which are worn at all too many a poetry reading. Inclusive, not exclusive. Fun, not funereal. Sexy, not sexless. Intelligent, not unintelligible. But who knew that poetry could even do that? Could even be like that? Fucking wow. So good luck, I say, to those who wish to continue wandering lonely as a cloud. My respect, even. Just please don't presume to claim the whole art form as yours and yours alone. Other poetics are also available. Here. Sugaring the P word, rebranded as performance poetry, slam poetry, stand up poetry, spoken word and live literature. Here were poetry events and poets, single poems even that can take black consciousness, pink power, blue jokes and a green manifesto and wrap it all up in a red flag emblazoned with the golden words. If we can't fucking dance, it's not our revolution marching fearlessly and unapologetically apologetically towards the true mainstream of our culture ready to tattoo the hearts of anyone who will listen oi emperor we can see your ass mate we have come to spread the word thanks thanks for listening um so yeah that was absolutely life-changing for me to uh, to find that scene absolute joy uh, what i did in the back of the book uh, that that manifesto ended with these are my poems other poems are also available and I listed two page worth of maybe 150 uh, poets that I knew at that time for, for people to uh, check out, you know, trying to spread the word as it were. I, I'm realising now that I've hardly spoken for 12 months. So uh, in speaking this evening, I'm going to have a few fro frogs in my throat, I'm afraid. We're going to have to uh, live with that. <coughs> so I don't know how you guys uh, are coping. I don't know how you're getting through and what's helping you. But uh, as always, it's the arts and music in particular that's helping me get through. So I want to share a poem with you now about music and what it means to, to me, perhaps to you, and to us as a culture in this community. About uh, 18 months ago, two years ago, I had the absolute honour of being invited to write a poem for the final banquet of the Great British Menu series. And if you've seen it, it's a chef's competition on BBC Two, National BBC Two. 
and it, each year it has a theme. It was um, 75 years of the NHS recently. The year I did it, it was um, um, 50, 60 years of great British music. Uh, what would it be? 50 years of British music from, from the Beatles' final gig to that performance. And the banquet was held in Abbey Road in the massive Studio One there in front of all sorts of current and former music legends. No pressure, live on TV. Can you summon up uh, 50 years of great British music in 90 seconds? Uh, it's still on um, the BBC iPlayer, you'll find it. So 90 seconds, uh, I did okay with that time, but there was lots more that I uh, wanted to say. So I came home and I fleshed the poem out. And um, at the moment it's called Written in Lipstick. My tribute to um, 50 years of British music and, and what it means to us, particularly as you, as you get a little bit older and look back on it, you realise how glorious those days were. And here we go, Written in Lipstick. How to put into words what the world understands about music and artists and bands from these lands across Britain. It's written, kids lighting the fuse because they've something to say and they've nothing to lose. All the rough kids, the tough kids, the sus kids, the freaks, all entwining their rhymes in entangled techniques. And in schoolrooms, in bedrooms, rehearsal rooms, bars, there's a beaten up kid with a battered guitar and in garages, cellars and rooms above pubs. The gods do what they do when she does what she does. Just a kid in a box room. That cul-de-sac girl in that room writes that tune, Sonic booms round the world and a star man is waiting. He is on my TV. He is here to blow minds and he's pointing at me. With your mates from estates, you escape when you dance. If you're given fuck all, then you must take your chance. So the Irish kids, Asian kids, Africans, Jews, mix Britishness, grittiness, black, white and blues, mixing street kids and beatniks and rasters and dreads with their hearts in the charts and the hits in their heads. Queerness, peerlessly, fearlessly freaking the beats, making groundbreaking sounds, taking shrieks from the streets. And they mashed it and bashed it and smashed it about and they union jacked it and spat it back out to the rock charts, the pop charts, the underground scenes, killer riffs, killer quiffs. Killer watts, killer queens, dropping chart topping, heart stopping, hard rocking hits, showing nobody, nobody rolls like the Brits. We've been mods, we've been rockers, we're hippies and punks. We put dub in the clubs and the fun into funk, making art pop and chart pop and hard rock and soul and shoegaze and new wave and new rave and soul. The Brit pop, the synth pop, the metal and rock, the disco, the techno, the acid, the lot, plus the drum and the bass. And the dubstep and drill and the hip hop, the trip hop, the turntable skills, with a sound clash of reggae and dancehall and ska and a loud splash of bangra and angry guitars, our R and B B boys, our DJs, MCs, our UK speed garage, our BJs, BGs, LPs, and we climbed up our drain pipes and set off our flares and mate, it was great, but the state of your air, but the dancing. Romancing the cues and the screams, the weekend, the deep end, the glitter ball dreams. Oh, the glam and the glitter, the glory, the glitz, the beatbox, the boombox, the ballroom, the blitz. As victorious girls jazz notorious boys and they're freeing your being with glorious noise. The hot night, the spotlight, the dance floor, the dancer, whatever the question for this is the answer. Your brain and your veins flame in time with the beat and the love floods your blood and it thuds through your feet and then you dawned and horny, reborn and then we are resplendent, ascendant, transcendent and free, one wavelength, one rave strength, one race and one bass with one funk drunk, a bliss piss to kiss disco face. Then the outrage, the front page, the stunts and the antics, the fevered and frenzied, the fervent and frantic, the fashion, the passion, the pistols, the clash, still coming with drumming and strumming and thrash. They rhymed it and primed it. They locked it and loaded. They pumped and it pumped till it fucking exploded. The filth and the fury, the sinners, the sin, the twists and the shouts, man, the candles, the wind, the boys with their makeup, the girls with guitars. I need that, the feedback, the spiders from Mars, the rebels, the levels, the devil said child, go crazy, go crazy, a baby go wild. So we've dressed and undressed it and dressed it back up. Live forever in leather and sexy as fuck. But the truth is that youth must replace number one. There's a new beat per minute, the bass rumbles on, now this grime, diamond girl swirls a new way to move. And this sweet refuge, street refuge Jesus invents a new groove. And this tower block kid with his towering plans knows he holds the whole world in the palm of his hands. And that slow, low achiever, well now she's a diva and no one can stop her. But no one believed her. 
She's gospel truth told. She is pure rock and roll. She sings slowly. It's holy. She knows in her soul. Just one note from her throat. She emotes then one chord. I am weeping. Sweet Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the minds that it's changed and the trails that we've blazed and the pain that it's drained and the life that it's saved because we've screamed and we've dreamed and we've laughed and we've cried riding stairways to heaven with tickets to ride we're transported transformed and enriched in entrance with the world shouting louder the kids want to dance and we stand hand in hand and we sang and we sang still the killer what queens still the glitter ball gang every beat every line ever every song ever sung still ringing still swinging still singing still young Every smooch, every kiss, every cry, shy regret is still written in lipstick you never forget. More than just who I am, more like trust who we are. We are love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are na 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 na. Na 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 na. na. Etc. There we go. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you go on the Great British Menu, put my name in, you'll find uh, a version of that on the BBC iPlayer. And at when the moment when I reference uh, Bowie on Stardust, which was a, a life-changing moment for lots of people, then they actually let me point down the camera like Bowie did. And uh, that, was a, that was a big moment for me. I was sat with Martin Kemp from uh, Spandau Ballet, and uh, he, he really got that. He commented on that. So here we go. Um, I'm going to read uh, this from my book now. Um, it's about not just the validity, but the importance of um, working-class people's stories being told and facilitated in the way that um, Write Out Loud and arts organisations do that. I worked in inner city regeneration for 18 years in Manchester and Salford and, and funded um, lots of arts programmes and uh, it's, it's, you know, the arts, what Write Out Loud does, it isn't just life enhancing and it isn't even just life changing, it's life saving sometimes. And this is a poem, you'll find it online, on SoundCloud, I think. It's about a woman who's got a great, you know, an important story to tell, but she's nervous about doing that. Uh, it's about the importance of, of why she should. It's a poem called Tiny, Tiny Dreams. Conceived against a shithouse wall, she was born against the odds, but then the pastors and her masters called her bastard before God. And they told her she was nothing. And nothing's all she knew. So she fought and schemed her tiny dreams because tiny dreams come true. Dreams of liberty and dignity to know love and respect in place of loneliness and poverty and cruelty and neglect. And she found her local library was a flawed but loyal friend with its once upon a time for bed, live happily, the end. And she found those books of public schools with wheezes, japes and schemes, just domestic science fiction. So she kept her tiny dreams. Then she thought she'd found a good lad who wouldn't hit her much but he kept her full of children then he wouldn't keep in touch and so what's a girl supposed to do when she's never known true love from a mother's hand or lover man or brother man above she just does her best like all the rest to keep the wolves away until the welfare states the welfare of her children's pulled away and she's left back on her own again but emptier than before just forgotten rotten apple peeled and bitten to the core and she fights to win them back again but loses every round until her sanity humanity and tiny dreams are drowned now she lives on fags and bad news washed down with cheap regrets of her own if only loneliness of, of her own if only loneliness forgive me not forgets and she sleeps on either downsides under polyfestered covers the smell of cheap loneliness and the promises of others and she wakes up to a bad dream and stales in bed all day like a sad ghost with a bad dose of hound dog ground dog day but she doesn't hate the father it was 16 17 and he dared to show her kindness but was scared by tiny dreams and for one time in her life back then she believed she had some worth as a lover as a mother as a citizen of earth so she finds her local library is welcoming and warm she finds comfort there and summit there that makes her feel reborn and she scours through the pages for that rarest thing in art truth and beauty in the rages of a kindred spirit heart 
and she finds few words that touch a nerve, one for every mile of shelf. So she hides away and scribes away and writes the book herself and she bleeds it in a notebook with a pen held like a knife to the hacking throat of fortune in the death throes of a life. And she tears it from her writing pad and hides it in a drawer. But if you think about the life she's had and what she's writing for, it's her tiny dreams of dignity, to know love and respect in place of loneliness and poverty and cruelty and neglect. And you'll find only one conclusion. Find the one important sign. There'll be beauty, truth and poetry in every fucking line. So what Write Out Loud does, what libraries do, what arts organisations to do, it isn't something peripheral, it isn't something unimportant, it's life changing and life saving. You should fight for it. Two more poems from me. How are we doing out there? Are we all okay? Um, this is the compulsory lockdown poem. I wrote a couple. This is one I wrote just after, in the middle of the first lockdown and just after the, the George Floyd terrible incident in America and the whole Black Lives Matter thing. We had a show, a live stream show with the Contact Theatre filmed at Berry Met and it felt like a really important moment uh, the weekend after, during, I think, the Black Lives Matter protests. So this is a, a lockdown poem that tries to uh, let people feel seen and uh, to offer us some hope. It's called Know This. If there's stubble on your double chin, your bum's gone fat and ideas run thin, if the only tonic left is gin, know this, she said, know this. If your gut's gone south and your hope's gone west, if you can't get up and you can't get dressed, if the weight of stress compressed your chest, know this, she said, know this. If you hope that no one sees your room as you wear a smile to meet on Zoom, then pain and strain and doom and gloom. Know this, she said, know this. If your dreams have shrunk and as your hair has grown, your future's passed and your roots have shown, you're on the slide and you're on your own. Know this, she said, know this. If you, if you wake up, you forget, but then, the kids keep asking why and when is mummy, mummy now again. Know this, she said, know this. If you find you're crying every day, if you go to sleep so it goes away, if you just can't take another day, know this, she said, know this. If the bills have come but the money's gone, the best days cancelled, one by one, you can't go back, but you can't go on. Know this, she said, know this. If you've worked so hard, but underpaid, afraid to say you feel afraid quietly, at times you've prayed. Know this, she said, know this. If life has dealt the cruelest blow, you've lost someone you love. You know, the funeral came, but you couldn't go. Know this, she said, know this. If simple things now seem like bliss, a hand to hold, a hug, a kiss, that face, that place, and how it's missed. Know this, she said, know this. If you and yours feel frightened, spurned, feel hated, threatened every turn, feel rage that makes our cities burn, Know this, she said, know this. So beautiful, we laugh and talk. So fragile how we breathe and walk. We're all just rainbows drawn in chalk. Know this, she said, know this. The day will come when this will end. We'll hurt, but we will heal and mend and we will meet again, my friend. Know this, 
she said, know this when you and me and us, a crowd as one, together singing proud, we'll sing again and sing it loud. Know this, she said, know this. The fear in here is defeated when our faith in love is stronger than compassion. Justice rise again and peace and freedom rise again. A better world will rise again. Know this, she said. Grow this. There we go. And uh, now I hope you're doing okay out there. I hope you, you've got somebody to reach out to. I hope you've got something to look forward to. And, uh, you know, this, this is a special thing. The way we can connect through art and through networks like this is a, a privilege uh, to be involved in. Uh, tonight's a fundraiser. I believe it's free of charge. But uh, right out loud, um, I've got a, um, a fundraiser going currently. Do please donate a little bit if you can. There'll be details within the whole program uh, if you stay tuned. Um, it's a, an amazing lineup. It's an absolute privilege to be amongst these fine poets, new and old. And I pay tribute to everybody involved tonight. Thank you to everybody uh, who's uh, made this happen. A huge tribute to all the team at Write Out Loud, particular, particularly Julian Jordan, whose vision this has been and whose labour of love this has been for 15 or more years. Thank you, Julian. Well done, mate. All the best. If you donate, uh, anything you can donate will be a big help and it will be matched penny for penny, pound for pound. So your fiver becomes a tenner, your tenner becomes uh, 20 quid. And they're trying to really uh, up the game and employ staff and uh, really take things to the next level. I'd really encourage you to donate, to take a look at the website, riceoutloud.net, and see how you can get involved. I'm going to leave you with a poem that I was closing my set with on my last tour. It's a poem that's become important to me and it's in a theme that I've been working in a lot recently. A number of my recent poems are on similar themes like this. And it's the sort of territory that science and religion and spirituality and philosophy have been fighting uh, over for millennia, really. What's it all about? It draws on the teachings of people like um, Alan Watts, if you're into your meditation and your yoga and the cosmos man, then you'll, uh, you'll get what I'm uh, on about here. Um, it references, if you know a lot of reggae songs, old dub reggae songs, it talks about uh, I and I, the Rastafarian concept of, uh, of the holiness in me and the holiness in you, connected with the holiness of the divine, similar to the, to the, the concept of Namaste, it, it references that. So this is a poem called Your Majesty, as in Your Majesty, you're amazing because you're part of nature, you're part of the planet, you're part of the universe and that is amazing. Don't feel tiny within it, feel empowered by being in part of this beauty and wonder. It's called Your Majesty, I'll leave you with this. Uh, my name's Tony Walsh, thank you and very best wishes to everybody. Your Majesty. Let it dawn that you're born universal. No, the stars aren't just shining at night. You're infinite, shining eternal. But most days, you're blind to the light. If it's written that God's universal, that means God is the universe too. When it dawns that you're all and eternal, then this holy creation is you. And this God space, the names we've collected, so be it, some timeless, some gone, but all in all things is connected. And the sum of all questions is one. If one ever feels hopeless or helpless with the ego and soul misaligned, sit stillness, breathe here now and selfless with the I and I found in divine. If one ever feels lost and redundant, unloved and adrift on our own, look inside for the love and abundance of multitudes never alone. In a conscious celestial ocean, a vital vibrational sea, we're apart, not apart from this motion, this stardust which sparks us to be. But what is it that blocks this potential? It's fear. It's clear. We're scared which denies you and I exponentially changing our lives and our world if we dare. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Let it dawn that you're born universal. Know the stars aren't just shining at night. You are energy, power, eternal. Beginning here, now see. Beginning here, now see. Beginning here, now see your beauty, your wonder, your lightning, your thunder. Beginning here, now see the light, be the light, free the light, see the light. Say the universe sees itself through me. 
me. Here now is where now now unfolds. You're the universe watching. The universe watching you. Watching your greatness. Behold. So don't ever feel tiny or worthless. Your majesty written in awe. This love lights our glory and purpose. To shine it is what we are for. Inside us one loved forged eternal. It's all things connected. The stars. It's you, you and you. Universal. That's everything. That's who we are. Thank you for listening. My name's Tony Walsh. Stick together, stay safe, and I hope to see you in the real world. Well, in the real world soon. Take care. Thank you. Wow. The inimitable Tony Walsh, the absolute hero that is Tony Walsh. We were so happy that Tony was willing to give up his time and record that set for us. Um, he's been a part of a right out loud journey for so long, as he said at the start, with that uh, flyer from 2004. Um, so, yeah, we're absolutely buzzing. Um, so we want to continue doing everything that Right Out Loud's done over the last 18 years. We also want to look at doing more online events like this, um, regular nights like this, producing more digital content, so maybe beyond podcast and poem films. Uh, also educational stuff, so non-formal adult educational stuff like online poetry workshops have been fantastic. And I think even when we sort of return to physical, physical gigs and the Zoom gigs don't happen as much, I think online workshops really will. Um, but as well as the adult non-formal non stuff, we're looking at doing more stuff in schools as well. So you might have seen that on Tuesday we hosted a giant poetry party in partnership with Lily Lane in Manchester. Um, and that links beautifully to Louise Fazakali, who I'm going to unmute, unmute and spotlight. Can it work? Will it work? Possibly. It's getting there. Hold on. Yes. Hello, Louise. How are you doing? Hey, Matt. I'm good, thanks. I've been limbering up, getting ready to perform. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we were just chatting about the school stuff. It was great on Tuesday, wasn't it? It was good fun. Oh, it was such fun. Like, the kids loved it. They love a bit of poetry and a bit of crazy poetry games and some shouting out and all that jazz. It was good. Yeah, it was lovely to have children online joining in as well. So for anyone who doesn't know, we, we had children in the Lily Lane in Manchester taking part and then also children on Zoom getting involved in interactive games and performing as well. Yeah, it was buzzing. It was ace. Kids are ace. I like kids and grown-ups. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Louise, the poet, one of the best poets in the world. Please welcome Louise. <laughs> oh, that is lovely. Okay, hi everyone. Um, right Out Loud um, was the place that I started to read my poetry and I had my shaky hands and my voice went like this and some of the poems were okay and some of the poems are terrible. You know, that's how we all start, isn't it? And hopefully... We get a bit better. Um, so um, I'd like to share a poem that I wrote for Wigan, like, you know, for a Wigan open mic. And now it's in my book. I'll show you my book. It's in my book, you walk Bird Street. Yeah. OK. Um, so this is a poem about um, education and being a teenager on a council estate and wanting to ride a horse. This is Angie's horse. Estate rats, we run the maze with ease to a triangle green between the high-rise flats. This girl, she brings this horse from nowhere. This young brown horse to our arena. A sign pauses in its fall, a stuttering tick at 10 to 10. At ten to ten, at ten to ten to ten to ten, ten, it's cowboy time. A sign pauses in its fall, a stuttering tick at ten to no all games allowed, and it's too hot to stay in bovine packed. The families are out, 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 the pensioners asleep, leaving us the in-betweens. We we'll line up to take turns, angular boys, streaks of girls, angular boys, streaks of girls. Shut the fuck up, you'll scare the arse. When so much glass has been smashed, the fragments are beautiful. Our alleys and ginnels and cut brews are a tarmac sky waiting 
for waves of change and a gallop of children, the sea, we rub each other's tide marks, a circumference of cheek. And I had never ever been on a horse. My goal, my goal goes too quick. And I don't vault a star from this carousel cause wooden desks don't work as wings. Instead, I watch perms bounce like pogo sticks until the sweating horse has had enough. A scaling shape left on the grass cause nothing is equilateral here. They don't want us to be winged horses. They want us to be wolves or sheep, easily led or benefits cheats. But we rise, we rise, we rise from benefit street and we find constellations to leap. Thank you. I think the lighting's a bit odd. I've had some Baileys, I've got a bit of a wine wash. Um, okay, thank you. So um, that was my Angie's horse poem. Um, and she, she went to a stables, it was very exciting. Um, okay, next up, I'd like to share a couple of poems um, from my first collection, which I'm really excited, what's come out with the Verve Poetry Press. Um, it's called The Lolitas, and it kind of explores um, what power teenage girls do and don't have. And it looks at like the triangle in the book between um, the teenager Lolita, her mum, and the, you know, paedophile stepdad. So I'm just want, giving you a little warning that there is a little bit of um, sexual content a bit here and there. Um, okay, so this is um, kind of a poem about why we should speak to young boys a bit more about what's appropriate um, with girls and boys. This is called Scent. From Saturday nights smashed to spelling tests. Let me spell it out for you. S C E N T. He tries. He tries. He tries to finger ya. the romance of sidelight. Train tracks on T. The scrubland is a waltzer. He tackles you, your hips spin the bottle. What the fuck? He WWFs you. Sex is sport. Skin cells on glass. Too scared to call to spectacle friends. Atoms, he'd kill them. He is a black hole, can't fit his thick hands down your baby fat jeans. Scroll bar, you're used to fighting. Fight him. Shake yourself off. He, stray Doberman, tracks you the two miles home. The only time you hope a car will stop. Be my girlfriend, be my girlfriend, be my girlfriend, be my girlfriend, stop. You say, stop it, you say, be my girlfriend, yes, you say. Deal with him in maths on Monday under the safe day of the teacher's reach. Can't take this shit home. No dirty secret on the doorstep for your mum to bleach. Thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to read the next piece that comes after that in the collection. Um, and I said the collection was a little bit um, about poems about me and about the world. And it's also, there's also some dystopian prose poetry in the, sounds very posh, doesn't it? Dystopian prose poetry. Feels a bit like a story. Um, so this is the next piece and it's called Spoke 657 Tomcat. And it's um, like a conversation between Lola and her best friend, Alice. Lola. There's this lad across the backs, and I think he's watching there, his window on the next spoke higher up than ours. There's these flashes of light. I think he's got binoculars or something to see me really good. Alice, 
shut up, Lola. Why does she always think they're watching her? Sometimes Lola reads her book full sat up to the window and leaves it props for when she isn't in the bedroom so that he could see what she was reading. Sometimes she sat on the floor in the corner in the front of a mirror propped against the wall. She drew her bony little self in her pink cotton knickers and triangle bra. Lola, this is Erte, right? Not dirty or anything. There's loads of nudies in art because the human body is freaking gorgeous. You'd like be like a sexy Botticelli or something if you was in art, Alice. The angle of sight from her window to his meant he probably couldn't see her, or maybe he could. I sat on Lola's Mars bottom bunk out of the way. Two little ducks, yak, yak, yak. Two little ducks, yak, yak, yak. Um, and because um, teenage girls are wonderful creatures, um, this is kind of um, a, a nicer poem about a first kiss, and it's called Playing Rounders. Playing Rounders. Grass shouldered, the orange brick wall at my back, scratcher as sought after stubble. Flamingo legged, I lean, 13, trying to be smaller. Apple head Adam, his bull cut, beatnik straight. First base, not base, my brace. Burst the bubble and the lip of his peachy face. Every night after that, like suction cups, we are stuck together, chewing up arms in the waltz position, tilted heads. He goes away, kayaking with his sink school, two burnt pink weeks in the Ardèche. His boyish, buoyant postcard navigates the stars. Too late, sucker, sucker punch. I caught with dear John his best mate, the backstop. Love and other indoor sports, Louise. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Thank you. Okay, um, so that's a little bit out of the Lolitas, um, just to give you a flavour of that. And because it's quite new, I'm enjoying sharing it with people. Um, I'd like to go back to some of the material that I wrote um, like primarily for performance and, and I've performed at loads of right out right at nights. Um, and this one is kind of about the importance of writers groups and the importance of reaching out to adults to help other people to write. Let me get it. Mm. It's, um, I, I performed at a night and a lady who worked in a, um, a, re a women's refuge saw me and she said, could you come and do some work at the refuge? Um, and we all wrote together. And this is about the writers group at the women's refuge. Okay. Writers group at the women's refuge. I asked them to answer the question. Why does the cage bird sing? I asked them to write about everything. Everything they know about black and white. They said old TVs, zebra crossings, newspapers, cats. They said funerals were Muslims dressed in white and Christians in black. The woman who understands more than she can speak, no confidence to answer the phone, writes in flowing script, suggests our her begins as black and turns to white with age. This poet in our midst, the girl who talks and talks and talks while saying very little, writes little rhymes of brittle dreams, little black dresses, Guinness, moonbeams. The woman who translates for her friends says she hates the opposition of black and white skin more than shades of browns and pinks called truths. Sat round this table, eight women, a United Nations of abuse. I asked them to answer the question. 
Why does the caged bird sing? I asked them to write about bags and baggage. I asked them to write about everything. Here, she says, three bin bags hanging off the pram, bags under my eyes. Here, she says, boot bags at the school gate. I couldn't stop to chat to the other mums in case I got home late. I was ashamed. He turned the kids against me. I ask them to answer the question, why does the caged bird sing? I ask them to speak their words at the charity's annual general, general meeting, and they do. Free hot pot cheese pie and beetroot red cheeks, more than tea and biscuits, eating lobbies, we watch women lobby big wigs, skin more than shades of black and blue. I ask them to speak their worth at the charities AGM. Unzip, leather lips, ungrit, broken teeth, broken jaws, broken dreams, dump the dirty laundry and leave it behind. Far, far behind. I ask them to write about the future and we sing. Thank you. Matt, have I got time for one more or not? Yeah, okay, lovely. So um, I'll finish off with um, a poem that is an invitation. It's an invitation to love and it's kind of an invitation to love my favourite weather, which is the rain. And right now I'm having a great time. I'm getting to sleep every night with my own personalised uh, rain track, sound track, it's amazing. Okay, so this is RSVP. I invite you to love. I invite you to love the rain. My childhood sat at an open door, awed as seaweed skirted girls fall, land and lift in these perfect, imperfect circles. My book abandoned to watch this ballet in the backyard. Even now, I'm just shopping and the rain slices through the everyday and the pink tarmac at the precinct is puddled and so mapped with these white flats of trodden chewing gum. It's like a cityscape. It's like Venice to my bird's eye view, let hoods fall, let the streets become streams, let the roads become rivers, let's ride the call of waves and beck where we will hop from slice of tyre to broken paving stone, stick out a tip of tongue and taste smoke air, cloud falls, spit and we're water, we're water, we're water as clothing and later as we room and warm indoors, a faint acid rain soundtrack plays. Pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. Thank you. I think the cat was applauding in the corner. You may have heard that meowing, I don't know. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, donate, donate, donate. We want to do more work in schools. We want to do more work with grown ups. Do you know what I mean? Poetry is amazing. Thank you, Louise. Amazing. That was so great. Um, so yeah, that brings us to the end, man. That's flown by. That's absolutely flown by. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's watched, everybody who's performed, everybody who's donated. Um, it's really, really hugely appreciated. It'll make such a big difference to us. Um, we've had Luke Wright, Lee Campbell, Rod Whitworth, Isabel Clark, Rachel Long, Peter Taylor, Rachel Burns, Heather Molson, Robert Garnham, Antonia Jade King, Tony Walsh and Louise Fazakale. It's just been a beautiful event. So thank you for watching. Thank you for donating. Thank you for your kind comments. Um, please continue su to support Write Out Loud however you can. And most importantly, just keep writing poetry and stay safe. So I'm going to stop broadcasting on Facebook now. Um, goodbye Facebook, thank you very much